On Friday morning, women in this country, like they have for nearly 50 years, woke up with a constitutional right to abortion, a right enshrined by the Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade and reaffirmed again and again. But just after 10 a.m. on Friday, a legal earthquake, the court stripping women of that fundamental right. In a 6-3 decision, the conservative majority upheld Mississippi's ban on abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy, with five of those justices voting to go even further, overturning Roe v. Wade. The first time an individual right of this magnitude set in decades of precedent has been taken away. Since the announcement, abortion rights activists have swarmed the court and launched protests across the country alongside anti-abortion rights groups celebrating a landmark legal and political victory decades in the making. Abortion is now a matter for the states and Congress, a decision for voters and their elected leaders rather than between a woman and her doctor. The decision had an immediate effect. As of this morning, abortion is now illegal in eight states. Seven additional states had passed so-called trigger laws that automatically went into effect once Roe was overturned. And in the coming weeks and months, a total of 26 states are expected to ban or severely restrict abortion. Just 16 states, plus Washington, D.C., have laws that explicitly protect access to abortion care. President Biden called Friday's decision a sad day for the court and for the country and talked about the steps the administration will take in the wake of the ruling. Amid so much uncertainty, what does seem clear is the emergence of a new era in which the Supreme Court, like so much of the rest of the country, is mired by partisan divide. It's all certain to keep the court at the center of a political battle to come this fall in the midterm elections. We will cover all the fallout from the landmark ruling and the state of play for reproductive rights across the country, including interviews with South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem and Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. But we begin with our ABC team covering the very latest. And Terry Moran, you have covered the court for so many years. The shock of this may have been tempered by the leak of the draft opinion in May, but you cannot overstate how important and what an impact this will have. Martha, this is the most consequential Supreme Court decision in decades. It changes the status of American women as citizens of the United States and as citizens of their states. That's the big picture, but let's not mince words. Women will die because of this ruling. We already have a disgraceful rate of more maternal mortality. But from now on, Doctors in many states will have to ask themselves in pregnancies where there are serious complications, a split placenta or a placenta in a dangerous position, will the local prosecutor, will the local jury think my patient is in enough danger for me to perform what I otherwise would consider a medically necessary abortion? And in 11 states already, including Texas and Florida, state governments can seize control of the bodies of women who have been raped, or who are victims of incest and compel them to carry the baby, the child of their rapist, to term. This is a different world for women in America. It, it certainly is. And I want to turn to you, Dan Abrams, our chief uh, legal analyst. At the heart of this decision is precedent. So what other existing rights could now be in jeopardy? Justice Thomas, of course, his concurring opinion, said the court should reconsider other past precedent cases like decisions on contraception, same-sex marriage. The court went to great lengths to suggest that it doesn't apply uh, to any of those other areas. But when you read Justice Thomas's concurrence, it's difficult not to ask the question, what could be next? He puts it all out there on the table, Justice Thomas. And while as a practical matter, it seems the court doesn't have the votes to overturn in any of those other areas, analytically, if you read the reasoning of the court, it's hard not to say that Justice Thomas's assessment is more intellectually consistent. I mean, if the whole reason uh, that this opinion is applying is because abortion, for example, isn't enshrined in our history, you look at these other rights and you say, well, they're not really enshrined in our history either. So while as a practical matter, I don't think you're going to see any of these other areas 
a change constitutionally as an analytical matter, it's tough to say, doesn't Justice Thomas's reasoning apply? And, and Cecilia Vega, chief White House correspondent, you're overseas with President Biden as he heads to the G7. The White House has known about the likelihood that Roe would be overturned for months. But were they really ready for this? And, and what kind of difference will those steps he outlined on Friday really make? Yeah, Martha, and I got to tell you, it's this history that's happening back home that is really starting to overshadow at least the first day here of this summit uh, with allies the president embark is embarking on today. Uh, we've been talking about this. There had been all of these emergency meetings behind closed doors at the White House with advocacy groups, with lawyers of the White House brainstorming on things that they could do when this decision came down. They basically started doing this as soon as that draft document leaked. And the White House sources are telling me that President Biden had that speech written, the response speech that he gave on Friday that it was already written. So when the draft, when the opinion actually came down on Friday, he went out there and gave it. He just had to give some minor tweaks. Look, they're certainly bristling at the suggestion that they were not acting fast enough, that they weren't prepared. But when it came time to give that speech, you heard it. There wasn't really very many uh, bold actions, responses in it. Look, there isn't an executive order that the president can sign that's going to overturn Roe. So what he did at this point, he is saying the administration is going to protect access to the abortion pill, that the DOJ will certainly certainly challenge any state that tries to restrict women from traveling to get the procedure. But you've got a lot of advocates right now who are looking to this White House as the face of this movement going forward, asking, is there more you can and should be doing? Where is the urgency today? And I want to turn to Dr. Jennifer Ashton. Dr. Jen, you're a board-certified OBGYN, so let's talk about the real-life impact here. Terry mentioned it, but abortion will now be largely outlawed in more than half the states. And you have made the very important point this week that it is not just women who will be affected by this. Absolutely, Martha. And I think, you know, first of all, there are so many different ways to look at this politically, socially, uh, legally, but medically um, and in the principles of biomedical ethics. You know, I think we have to remember that it's not just life or death, as Terry mentioned. Of course, uh, there are real medical issues um, and the life of the mother at stake. But it's also morbidity, um, and it's who will be affected by this. We know that 49 percent of the abortions done in this country are performed for women who live below the poverty level. This will disproportionately affect women of color, poor women who are already um, in jeopardy in terms of our health care system. We also have the worst maternal mortality rates of industrialized countries. This will make it worse. In the field of OBGYN, any healthcare professional who takes care of women knows that this will have an immediate impact, not only on a life or death level, but on a long-term morbidity level as well. And, and Terry, I want to end with you. This is a deeply polarizing and political issue. But Americans are actually pretty united in public opinion. On our latest ABC News Washington Post poll, 70% said the decision should be up to a woman and her doctor. 58% said abortion should be legal in all or most cases. You know, in the courts and in social media and in our politics, this is a very polarizing issue. But the country has always been, polls show, in the, the kind of vast muddled middle. People believe that abortion should be legal. They don't like it in a lot of situations. Bill Clinton, with his unerring sense of where the votes were, put it best, capturing the public mind this way, saying abortion in America should be safe, legal, and rare. Today, no Democrat could say that, and no Republican could say that. So where the vast muddled middle is, is unrepresented in our law and in our politics. Okay, thanks very much to you, Terry. Thanks to all of you this morning. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.